everyone. Welcome to First Christian Church Online. We're so glad that you're here today. My name is Jordan, and I'd love to connect with you. I um, want to encourage you today, as you're watching the service, to take a moment and reply to a chat. Say hey to somebody in there. Um, we'd love to connect with you. Um, also, you can always hop on over to scottsburg.church. That's our website. And on there, there's an online connect card. Uh, and I personally would love to connect with you this week if you fill that out and let us know how we can walk with you. Um, like I said, great things today. It's going to be a great service. Thanks for being back with us. We're glad that you're here. Let's take a few moments here and worship God. With all that I have, 
I will sing, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. There is a river that flows unrestrained from your heart. Canyons of mercy so deep I could never depart. Father, your wonders are endless. Open my eyes to believe. Awake my soul. Let everything that has been praise the Lord. Let everything that has been praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. With all
Hey guys, welcome to First Christian Church Online. I'm Lead Pastor Matthew Craig. And um, last week, we, uh, we broke up um, our Seven Seals sermon into two. And so this week, you will get the conclusion of that sermon, ser- or that sermon on the Seven Seals. I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much for being here with us. And um, I'm looking forward to continuing this series with you. God bless you guys. Thanks for joining us. If you want more information about what we do, where, where we are, who we are, um, you can check our website out at scottsburg.church. But let's jump in. And uh, as I conclude um, this week's sermon, God bless you guys. The third seal that's opened, the third horse, it's the black horse. Revelation chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. When the lamb broke the third seal, I heard the third living being say, Come. I looked up and saw a black horse, and its rider was holding a pair of scales in its hand. And I heard a voice from among the four living beings say, A loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay. And don't waste the olive oil and the wine. This black horse is, is unique. This scheme of the devil, this, this horse, is the horse of famine and poverty. Matthew 24, Jesus says it like this, nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against nation. That's the red horse. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. This, this is the, the black horse. There will be famines and earthquakes. Now, there's two ways to think about famines and poverty. One is the physicalness of it, the famine, the actual literal being hungry, the, the actual being poor and, and not being able to provide. This, this is part of the black horse's scheme is to keep you so poor, so hungry that you fail to see the goodness of God. But I think the real dangerous part of the black horse is not the physical famine, not the physical poverty, but this, this horse brings another kind of, of poverty. Here it is. It's Notice verse 6. It's interesting why this is stated this way. I heard a voice from among the four living beings say, a, a loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay. Let me stop there for just a moment. The things that you will need to survive will be so expensive that you can't have them. It will cost you so much that you will be hungry for them. And you will want them and you will desire them, but you won't be able to afford them. The cost is just too much. The cost is just too great for you. And notice what happens next. Don't waste the olive oil and the wine. The black rider is given instructions to to make what you need so costly that very few will go after it. But don't spare the olive oil. Don't spare the wine. Don't spare the things that are used to numb you, to suppress you. When someone was in pain or starving, just like Jesus was on the cross, they were offered this sour wine that would dull the senses. Here's what I think is behind the imagery of this black horse. John is telling his, his churches that, that for Rome, Rome's going to offer you everything that makes you feel good. Rome's going to offer you every thought, every way out that's going to dull your senses. Sensuality. Through Rome and all of its goodness, through Rome and all of its glory, it's going to make you feel really good. But it's not going to give you any life. The life that will sustain you the life that will bring you through, the life that the black horse does not have, 
just cost too much. See, Jesus tells us that, doesn't he? He's already told his disciples this. John's, John's just bringing this imagery back. He said, count the cost. Broad is the way, only a few find it. The cost of following Jesus is too high. What do you mean I have to give to the poor? What do you mean I have to live a life of generosity? What do you, what do you mean I have to sacrifice good things to find great things? What, what do you mean that I have to put Jesus first? What do you mean that I can't have everything of the world and still have Jesus? Remember the Antichrist? He's going to tell you you can have everything, but, but don't pick up that cross. It's, it's too heavy. You can't afford it. Just, just go out and just go out and tell them off. Tell them the way you really think. It's good enough. Don't, don't be forgiving. Don't be compassionate. And when you're hungry, when you're hurting, when you're when you think, man, I don't have anything else, to, just soak in Rome. Soak it in. Take the olive oil. The black writer has olive oil and wine galore. Don't waste the olive oil and the wine. Just give it free handed. It's fine. Just give it. This black horse just wants to dull the pain. This poverty, this famine, it's, it's deeper than the physicalness of not eating. And it's the poverty of your soul. And ultimately, that's what the Antichrist and these riders of the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse want to do. They want to keep you spiritually poor, spiritually isolated. They want to keep you away from everyone that you love, everyone that cares about you. They don't want you to listen to the truth. The truth stinking hurts. It's not easy to follow, and I don't want to hear it. Truly, if we're honest with ourselves, we, yeah, we love Jesus, and we want to be forgiven, and we want to go to heaven, and we want to do all this, but we don't want to hear the truth. The truth means I have to, I have to do some things. My theology should impact my reality. But not here, not with the black horse, not with Rome. And these churches under great persecution. Man, there's some of them there in the churches that just, just want the pain to go away. And so they look at Rome and they see all of Rome's goodness. They see all the success of Rome. And they see the disciples in prison and poor and hungry and beaten. I don't want that. I want Rome. This is the black horse. Who are you chasing today? Which horse are you riding today? Which horse are you following today? One preacher said, we're chasing after numbers on a balance sheet. And, and we chase everything and we find nothing. The only thing that we find at the end of the day is that we're defeated and we're tired, we're poor, and we're hungry. And all we're doing is chasing numbers on a balance sheet. We're, we're chasing success. Our souls are famished on the inside. And this is the black horse having everything, but yet nothing. You see, the Antichrist, this first horse, wants to make you feel like you're actually wearing this crown of thorns. And then it confuses and isolates. And the red horse takes over and we rage and we're anxious and we're bitter and we're arrogant. 
we're arrogant enough to think that we can handle it on our own, all just keeping my cross just to, just there. The black horse shows up and says, you don't really want that. I mean, you don't want that. That's, that's painful. Let me show you what you really want. Have some wine. Have some olive oil. Have some of this. And all of these horses, they're there to distract us. So that when the fourth horse shows up, there's no way out. The fourth seal is opened And in the four seals, the fourth horse, this pale horse, it's actually this yellowish green. It's the color of stomach bile. It is the color of sickness and death. I don't don't mean to be morbid, and I don't mean to, to be disrespectful. But have you ever seen someone in their last dying days, the color of their skin, leaves their body and sometimes fluids <laughs> this is the picture of the fourth horse because the fourth horse is death it's sickness it's weakness this fourth rider brings disease this is the fourth horse that none of us can defeat Revelation chapter 6, when the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard a fourth living being say, come. I looked up and I saw a horse whose color was pale green. Its rider was named Death and his companion was the grave, Sheol, Hades. These two were given authority over one fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and famine and disease and wild animals. This fourth horse It is the very same thing that um, th- this is the ultimate. It's what we're trying to escape from. We don't want to die. No one wants to die. This horse, this fourth horse is a summation of all the others. It is really the victory of the Antichrist. If he can keep you numb and dumb... And when death comes, it's too late. You see, Paul tells the Corinthians, after, the, after that, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father. That's Jesus, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all of his enemies beneath his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Jesus Christ destroyed death. Jesus Christ is the one who destroyed death. Jesus is the one who won the victory over death. You and I haven't done that. We're going to die unless Jesus comes again soon. Hosea 13, verse 14, I shall ransom them from the power of Sheol. I shall redeem them from death. O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion is hidden from your eyes. This fourth horse, the horse of death, that's why John's weeping. Because remember why he weeps. Why does he weep? Because no one is able to open the scroll. No one is able to take the seals off. No one is able to get to this. And, And so what we're left with is death and decay and sickness and war and rage and famine. And the Antichrist sits there, the first horse sits there and says, that's all there is. When you die, you die. That's why John is sad, because no one can open up the fifth seal, the sixth seal, and the seventh. No one can open it up, and so we're left. And so we find this, this question, who, who, who can stand? We see this in Revelation chapter 6. One other thing to mention here, it says these two Death and Sheol, this, this riders, these two riders, the, the, the fourth horse and his companion, they were given authority over one-fourth of the earth. This is, 
showing us a glimpse in what John's doing here. Here in, in Revelation 6, they're given one-fourth. In Revelation chapter 8, the next set of threes, they're given one-third. And then in the final set of Revelation chapter 16, they're given all authority. This progression, this, this deepening, again, it, it shows us what John is doing here. He's, he's telling us the same story, but in depths and deeper depths and in more detail. Leading up to this final imagery, this, this final conclusion, this ultimate reality of the end. When Jesus comes again, who can stand? When Jesus comes again to redeem death, to, to show us victory over the grave, to give us victory over the grave, when it, when it comes, who can stand? Who can survive? It's those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And this leads us to the fifth seal. The fifth seal is, is opened, and, and it is the martyrs. We move from the horsemen to the martyred, those who have been killed for the testimony of Jesus. And they, they say, when are you going to avenge us? When, when is judgment day coming? When are you going to set all things right? When are you going to make all things new? And the one said, in time. Be patient. It's not time for that yet. There's still more to be saved. There's still more to do. This points us to the long suffering that Peter talks about. Second Peter chapter three, but you must not forget this one thing, dear friends, as Peter writes to these churches dispersed throughout the world. He said, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord, listen to this, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. What promise? Jesus coming again. Jesus setting all things right. Jesus conquering, giving us victory over the grave, giving us victory over the Antichrist, giving us victory over war, get, taking sin and, and all of this away. That's just the promise, right? God's not being slow in that. Some people think, no, he's being patient for our sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. And so unleashed on earth are these four horsemen. Unleashed on earth are these plagues, this famine, rage, and death. Unleashed on earth is the Antichrist. Why? To give people opportunity to turn to Jesus to see the full completion of God's work to be done. We'll talk more about the 144 in our going deeper thing, our going deeper class, but, but the fifth seal shows God's patience. And then the sixth seal is opened, and God's judgment comes, and God judges the world. We see it happen. After this, I saw a vast crowd do great to crowd. Verse 9, chapter 7. Where did this crowd come from? Well, it came from God's kingdom, those who, those who could stand. You see, the sixth seal was broken. There was a great earthquake. It was great judgment. All the nations, all the rulers, they hid. And then they ask the question, it's the one we've talked about, Revelation chapter 6, verse 17, for the great day of their wrath has come. The day of the wrath has, has come. And the one who is able, who is able to survive. And then in John's writing, there's always an interlude. We talked about that briefly. But between the sixth seal and the seventh seal, the seventh seal answers the ultimate reality. There's an interlude that happens. Here's the interlude. After this, I saw a vast crowd. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. It was too great to count. From every nation, tribe, and people, and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb, 
They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. In the midst of all of this horseman stuff, in the midst of chaos and the Antichrist and in rage and war and famine and pestilence and death, in the midst of all of this, God's judgment comes. And who are those who survived? Who are those who can stand against this great day? It is those who have clothed themselves in white robes. It is ones who have joined in with the Lamb. And God says, wait. During the, during the fifth seal, there's this moment when God's patience shows up, when, when God's judgment, right before God's judgment is made, and, and, and by no mistake, a seal is placed on the heads of those who follow the Lamb. And there they are sealed. And when God's judgment happens, in the midst of death, in the midst of war, in the midst of pain, what do you and I have that no one else has? We have the joy of the Lord. And here in Revelation, what does this great crowd before the Lamb, what, what do they do? They start shouting. They start singing. They worshiped. They fell to their faces and worshiped God. They sang blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. The 24 elders threw themselves and they asked me, who, who are these who are clothed in white? Where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, you are the one who knows. And then he said to me, these are the ones who have died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb. And then they sang. And they worshiped. Here's the point. Here's the interlude. Here's the main idea. Here's why John writes to the church is in this way. The world is going to try to take everything from you. The world is literally going to try to, to kill you. And it may very well kill you. Death may happen. And you're going to feel rage and you're going to feel anxious and you're going to feel persecuted and you're going to feel alone and you're going to feel isolated and you're going to be hungry you're going to be poor in mind what to do next, where to go. And when all of this happens, know what's going on. Know what's the Antichrist trying to pull you away from the very thing that can save you. You see, in the end, those who, who can survive, those who will stand, it's those who have given their lives to Jesus. And they worshiped. Eugene Peterson said, these people are not only secure, they're exuberant. This is a curious but wholly biblical phenomenon. In the most frightening reputations of evil, Revelation 6 and the four horsemen, God's people are set alongside them in ex extravagant praise, Revelation chapter 7. He says, Christians sing, they worship. They worship in the desert. They worship at night. They sing in prison. They worship in the storm. In the face of any evil, evil, no matter how fearsome, how gruesome, how large, how exposed, in the face of worship to our king, they are exposed as weak, overconfident in what stands as the song of the saints. The seventh seal is broken. And you know what happens in the seventh seal? It simply says this. When the lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence throughout heaven for about a half hour. Matthew 24, verse 14. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end 
will come. Why does John write? Why do we listen? Because right now the four horsemen are actively at work and they are doing everything they can to pull you away from the truth. They are trying to do everything they can to make you feel comfortable, to let you play the game. But in the end, who can stand? It's those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. I don't know what horse you're riding today, but I know what, I know who can give you peace. Are you raging? Are you anxious? Are you hungry? Are you trapped in, in the world and all of its pleasures and success? Are you so close to Jesus that yet you're not really there? There is a step you can take. That step is to give your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength to Jesus Christ. Hear what he's calling us to. Who's in charge? trouble comes, who's in charge? He is. When trouble comes, what does he want from us? Trust and faith. Obedience. And when trouble comes, what is he calling us to? He's calling us to share that message, to tell that message, to to love our neighbor and to love God. I hope you'll join us for more. There's so much more that I could talk about, but I've gone long enough. Thanks for sticking with us. God bless you guys, and we'll see you next time. Have a good day.